was sick on Monday with some, some intestinal fluid. Pretty paralyzing. All right, I'm going to try to talk about both electroweak unification and grand unification today. Unless you really want to hear about something else. Sounds good. All right. The electroweak unification has been confirmed experimentally in large part, although of course the Higgs hasn't been found. So let me describe, let me just first mention something about um, the Yang Mills uh, puzzle when it was originally introduced. We've talked about Yang Mills theory many times. And um, Yang Mills were kind of disappointed by nature at first because uh, the only massless particle that they knew of was the photon well and the graviton. And, um, you know, so where, are, where were the massless gauge bosons? Well, it um, eventually turned out in the late 60s and 70s and early 80s, confirmed experimentally, that um, the missing massless gauge bosons say SU3 gauge theory with a W and a Z, and these acquired mass through the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, and um, so you didn't see them because they were too massive to be produced in fire accelerators, weren't produced until the late 70s. Um, the other massless gauge bosons are those of SU3, and they apparently are confined inside uh, hadrons. Um, Okay, so that was that, that was that. So the question then is how to unify uh, the electroweak interactions. And the, the first thing about the electroweak interactions is very embarrassing. And in fact, you, you might ask why are some people skeptical about string theory and about grand unification and about supersymmetry? Well, one thing is that there are other things, there are very simple things that are striking and that aren't understood. And I'll leave aside to find them. Namely, the weak interactions act on the left handed quarks and leptons, not on the right handed PS. And one needs an explanation for that. And without that explanation, it seems a little bit preposterous to go to leap several levels of theory and 10 orders of magnitude and energy and think you know what you're doing. It's just absurd. Um, the other thing is that we have three generations of quarks and leptons. There's no explanation for that. And uh, so we should unify quarks and leptons before we even understand why there are three. Um, anyway, so the but the electroweak part is, um, is a successful unification. So what we've got among the leptons, and let's just look at the first generation, is um, the right-handed the, the, the right uh, neutrino field, uh, if it exists, doesn't interact, at least in any obvious way, and so it's left out of the, uh, of the weinberg salam model. And um, the idea is to introduce terms like this, W plus mu, nu bar L, gamma mu E L, plus W minus L, B e bar L, gamma mu nu L, where L means left-handed and um, and you see that, that those interactions can basically give you um, what, uh, what you want. Namely, that this one can say that an electron goes along, becomes a neutrino, and out comes a W plus. Well, annihilates an electron. It must be a W minus. Yeah, well, this annihilates the W plus. That's what it is. Okay, so that's the picture, and then if you look at this process, this theory in second order, what you have is that this guy comes over here, and um, uh, you can imagine another electron coming in, and another neutron.
neutrino bar. Well, let's see, no, a, a, a positron coming in, a neutrino going out, and he absorbs. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so in other words, the W minus is coming out and But then you can serve charge at that vertex. Yeah, minus comes in, combines with a plus, and you get a new. Uh. Okay, so this is electron. Electron goes to nu nu bar, and uh, this is a weak interaction. This is the sort of same thing. You wanted to detect this? Good luck. Um, First of all, it's a weak interaction. Secondly, the final state is essentially unobservable. All right, so um, anyway, but the point is that in second order, this, I mean, if you just compute this Feynman diagram, what do you get? You get uh, mw squared, and then you get uh, whatever the coupling constant is here, pull this little g. We're not really going to call it little g, but then this would be g squared. And so what you want is that this should reproduce the results of the Fermi theory, which is big G Fermi. And um, let me see, what was um, big G Fermi? Um, I must say, I had a 230i appointment. I didn't get out of the I doctrinal apply. Uh, plan to prepare this lecture more carefully this afternoon. Um, anyway, this this is the weak interaction um, uh, vertex here of the Fermi theory, and the Fermi theory would have um, essentially it would have the product of these two things. So you'd have essentially. Um, Nu bar L down on mu E L uh, and what do I have there? E bar L down on mu uh, nu L and um, the E the 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 E L in both cases um, can be re-expressed as gamma mu one and I don't remember the sign but it's plus or minus gamma five E and then uh, E bar gamma mu one plus or minus gamma five nu. So in other words, you can replace this by a four vector here. You put in the right-handed field, but it gets projected out by this as a projection operator. In fact, whatever this thing is, it's a four by four matrix that's, a, that's one zero zero zero. So, so it just projects out the left-handed part. The left-handed is new. New L is just is a two-component object? That's right. Okay. New L is the two components. In other words, new L is the first two components of the of the four, four spinner. So this transforms on the left-handed Lorentz transformations, right-handed Lorentz transformations. And these, by the way, are like this. It's e to the z dot sigma and e to the z star dot sigma star. So it's basically one is the complex conjugate of the other. There are actually two other ways of writing it. This is, is this new L or is this just new? Brilliant, okay. All right, you've, I don't know where I am with the chocolate, so I, Does anybody need a chocolate? Oh, Jesus, sorry. You're too shy. Here. How about the grater? I don't mind. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so. So, in other words, Fermi introduced what? What he and everybody, what he and everybody regarded as a phenomenological theory, and I thought I would find it here, but somehow, I mean, it is here somewhere, but I don't remember where it is. Anyway, 
it was uh, essentially of this form here. In fact, once you put the one plus or minus gamma phi, whatever it is, it uh, when you move it through the gamma mu and the gamma zero that's here, it acts to the left as well as to the right. And uh, so GF was essentially identified then as G squared over MW squared. And then the weakness of the weak interactions was interpreted as the high mass of the W. And um, what that means is the interactions are a very short range. They're not really weak, they're a very short range. Okay, so the, the interaction then is a WA mu psi bar L tau A gamma mu psi L, where psi L is this thing here, nu E. We don't really need to include ER in there. Well, we will. It'll be in there. It'll be in there enough. Uh, in there somewhere. See it here at the moment. Um, so we're just doing the psi L part at this point. And we can rewrite this as 1 minus I 2 mu. And this is a rather strange notation. I've never seen it. I'm following here the treatment of um, of Z in his book, uh, the second edition of quantum field theory in a nutshell. So this is sidebar L a half and tau of one plus I two, and of course tau one plus I two is tau one plus I tau two. And um, so it's that gamma mu psi L plus emission conjugate. And then we add in one other term, namely W3 mu psi bar L tau 3 um, gamma mu psi L. Now, actually, what I should say is this was sort of the first attempt, and this wasn't this wasn't something that either Weinberg or Slom. Well, Blashow took seriously. For, for, so far, what we've done is we we we, we just have gauged the uh, Yang Mills SU3 theory, SU2 theory. So we gauge SU2, the uh, the generators of the core, okay. and uh, what we basically <coughs> have is e to the i uh, uh, theta a tau a where the tors are just replacing the sigma matrices and the corresponding gauge fields of the W. Now, the problem, yeah? Uh, so are the, so is this different then? Are the W pluses over here related in any way to the W1 and then zero? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. W plus is W1 plus I W2. Okay. Apart from maybe a root. Okay, now, there's a problem with this, though, because here we would have three gauge bosons, okay? And uh, what about the mass term? Well, the mass term would come from this Anderson-Higgs mechanism, so we would have some d phi absolute value squared, okay? Where phi is taking some mean value in the vacuum. So that means and of course the mass term doesn't come from the ordinary derivative. It comes from something like, I'll call it again G, uh, W A tau A mu, and now times whatever the value is of the, in the Higgs field. And um, this will be, well it turns out we're going to have it something like zero V apart from, again, a factor of root two or something. And um, so what happens? Well, 
None of the Torahs annihilate this. Okay? In other words, after all, this is spin down. Tor down, Tor 3 will multiply it by minus 1. Tor 1 will throw it into a linear combination of 1 and 2, and so will Tor 2. Uh, uh, another way of saying it is that these gauge transformations don't leave the vacuum invariant. And the result is that all three gauge fields get a mass. And in other words, since tor A, since the mass, in other words, this is going to be MA squared W mu A squared. That's what this thing is going to be, apart from a factor of two. And um, consequently, the, co the mass MA is going to be proportional to G tor A zero V squared, well, that squared, and uh, since none of these is zero, all three masses are going to be non-zero. So this theory by itself doesn't work. And so what Weinberg and Salam and Glashow did was... Wait, why, why doesn't it work? Because, because you, well, well, because you want to want to... Uh, I mean, this is fine as a theory of the purely weakened directions. I see. But the idea was to unify the weakened directions with the electro with the electromagnetic interaction. Well, so you want, I mean, first, first of all, you only have three gauge fields, and you want four, right? You want the four right. Four. Right. Oh, well, all right. But the possibility was you could have said one of these W's will remain massless, and that'll be the photon. Okay. So, so, we'll, so, 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 so if the goal, let's put it this way: this might have been, and I stress, yes. might have been a valid weak interaction theory, but it wouldn't have unified things with the electromagnetic interactions. In order to bring in the electromagnetic interactions and unify them with the weak interactions, we need to have one of these W, one of these gauge bosons remain massless. So what we do is we make the gauge group bigger. So as a pure uh, weak theory, are the three bosons, the W plus, the minus, and the Z? I don't work. think so. Okay. I, I don't think they will work. And in fact, one reason why they're not going to work is that remember when I was trying to do this, I was looking for ER. Couldn't find it. Well, we'll see ER comes in in the full period. All right. So what we're going to do is, um, and in fact, what you can, what, all right, let me just mention something. What is this W3 coupled to? W3 is coupled to tor 3 here. And, um, well, it's not the electromagnetic current. It's, in fact, something that's nu bar nu minus E bar E. So the second part is essentially electromagnetic, but it's not even electromagnetic because it's doubly left. All right, so it's, it's really, it's, it's wrong in several ways. Okay, so the idea is to enlarge the gauge group to SU2 cross U1. And now the covariant derivative is a d mu minus i g w a mu and now we we'll use capital T A minus I G prime G mu something we'll call Y over two. And this thing is called hypercharge. And in fact, Z seems to refer to Y over two as hypercharge. Okay, well the the action density will be minus a quarter d mu nu squared minus a quarter w a mu nu squared plus dot dot dot. Um, this is abelian. This is the u1. <laughs> Bless you. And uh, so this is just a Maxwell, a Maxwell-like term. This is just an, this is quadratic in the field. This is quadratic cubic in quarter in the gauge. 
Okay. In other words, W A mu nu is D mu, W A nu minus D nu, W A mu, plus, and then it's epsilon A B C, W B mu, W C nu. So B, uh, <coughs> would B pick up another index here? Is this B like really, is B mu nu like the exterior derivative of B mu? I don't, how does B oh, get I, oh, B mu, no, here, B mu nu is just, I'm using just ordinary notation. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. I'm not using okay. a more formal language. Okay. Okay, and these t's are whatever, these, the t's and the y are whatever is appropriate for whatever fields one is dealing with. And in a moment, we're going we're gonna to see uh, what that will be. All right, now, what we're going to do is we're going to identify q as, let me call it alpha t3 plus a half y, and we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna stick with psi l and er. So we're staying with the leptons and the first family or the first generation. Leave aside the quarks for the moment. So we've got psi l is nu e l, and then we have er. And so this is a singlet under SU two and this is a doublet. Now we notice the charge difference between the neutrino and the electron is unit difference. We notice then that this will make sense, and the only way this will make sense, if Q is T3 plus a half Y. Because then, as we go from plus one half to minus one half, the charge will drop by one unit, and that's what we want go from neutral to minus one for electron. Okay. Uh, I didn't follow that. All right. Oh, sorry, there's a beta here. I still don't follow it. <laughs> All right, here. Is this Q like a Q term? of E, what is Q of E? Q of E is going to be now, first of all, y is a u1, okay? So the y is common for these two guys. Right. Okay. So what's q for the electron? It's alpha times 1 half plus theta over 2 y of psi l. Okay. okay. So this... Well, let me, let me, just for the others, if you caught off, let me just... Oh, oh, this is a minus sign. Yeah. Duh, because it's minus T3 minus So T3 is really one half times the poly matrix 3, right? So that's where the yes, one, yes, where the one yes, half yes, comes Yes, 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 right. yes. Because this is a doublet, so this is one half times the tally or one half times a tau. All right. So this is plus alpha one half plus theta over 2 y of psi sub L. Okay, and now we get QE minus Q nu is then um, minus alpha, and we want this to be minus one. So we get alpha equal to one. All right. So we have Q is P3 plus beta over two y. Well, what people do at this point is that you just set beta equal to 1 and just let y be whatever it has to be in order to make the charges right. I mean, it's just a phase, right? <coughs> and it's a gauge. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's fair. What the hell? Um, and so, so what do we do? What we say q of E, we want to be minus one, so that's minus one half from this, Q 
plus, and so I'm going to set beta equal to 1. This is then y over 2 of, again, uh, psi L. And then Q of nu is, um, oh wait, I already did this. Oh, no, I haven't finished this. We want this to be minus 1. And so, I mean, if we had kept the beta, then we, I mean, we could have kept the beta, but then that would just amount to be defining. We're going to assign the y's in this way. We might have, we'd either be defining beta y over 2 or just y over 2. So what we do is, is this is then y, uh, y over 2 for psi L is equal to minus a half. Now let's see if this works. Well, this is one half plus y over two, but y over two is minus one half, so we get zero. So it's consistent. All right. So there's a glimmer of truth in this. Okay. Now, what about er? Well, Q of ER causes minus 1. And Q of ER is just going to be y over, uh, y over 2 for E sub R. And that's got to be minus 1. So Y over 2 for ER is just minus 1. OK. And. This is because the, the, the T generators don't care about the right-handed fields? That's right. The T's aren't acting on the right-handed fields at all. That's okay. All right. It's SU2 left cross U1. And, and I, uh, that's my fault here. I should have put this L there. Okay, now. Now we're going to have um, we're going to have a mass term coming from the Higgs mechanism, and so we've got some coupling constant f, some psi bar l, some Higgs field phi, and some er. Okay. And. Um, what is this going to be? Well, let's just look at the invariance of this under hypercharge. Well, we just determined that this has hypercharge minus 1, E sub r. Uh, psi L has hypercharge minus 1 half. So psi L bar has hypercharge 1 half. So this is 1 half. And so that means that phi, y over 2, sub phi, should be 1 half. And indeed, that's what the book says. OK. So we've made this invariant under hypercharge by you letting this have hypercharge 1 half. By the way, this is a doublet. Why a doublet? It's a doublet to make it invariant under SU2, because this is uh, doublet also, and so this is anti-doublet, doublet, and it's invariant. It's like, apart from the gamma of matrix, this is just psi dagger phi. The psi dagger is a doublet under SU2, phi is a doublet under SU2, so that's invariant. Something is bothering you. Um, no, okay, I believe that. Right. Okay. I mean, that's just, that's just how the the, the W gauge field mixes up that vector, right? Well, W is certainly going to W, the W so the SU2 gauge fields. The SU2 gauge fields are the Ws. Yeah. And they mix, mix up uh, right. the new and the E, L, leaving the R stuff in there. So we're just saying that that Higgs field lives in the same. Uh, has to be just like this, has to transform under SU2 just like the sign. Right. Okay. 
And now, let's go beyond that. We found out what its hypercharge is to make it U1 invariant. So what is its charge? Well, phi plus, meaning the top one, is going to have charge 1 half because of the T3 plus 1 half from the y over 2, and that's 1, whereas phi minus is going to be minus 1 half plus 1 half is 0. So this then means, all right, and let's see what we get in the way of a, uh, a Higgs field in the vacuum. What's the vacuum value of this thing? Well, it's going to be F, and uh, this is going to be uh, new bar left, E bar left, zero V, because we want the neutral part to get the VEV. And um, the ER is just um, ER. And so this turns out to be FV, uh, E bar L, ER, and this is just basically a direct mass term. So this is the direct mass term, which is um, psi bar psi, which is again psi dagger a gallon of zero psi, and um, that gamma zero had better be something like that. One from maybe nine. Okay. Um, so in other words, to, to put it differently, if we had insisted, I mean, in order to get the Higgs mechanism to, to give us a mass term, it's got to be the lower component that gets the mean value in the vacuum. Otherwise, we wouldn't have E bar E. We'd have we'd have nu bar E, which would be yeah, hopeless. Um, and so then we're saying, well, the lower component gets a mean value in the vacuum. Then the field had better be neutral, or you know, empty space would be electrically charged, and everything would be really crazy. Okay, so we this is going more slowly than I thought, but I think it's more important to get through this clearly, which is a true theory that's somewhat elegant theoretically being a realization of the Yang Mills concept and verified experimentally, whereas, as I said earlier, grand unification could be, let us say, kindly premature, <laughs> theoretically premature. By the way, years and years ago, I was at a party in honor of Weinberg and Glashow, who had just won the Nobel Prize. George, I was there, and I was convinced that George, I was going to get the prize in a couple of years for grand unification. And the flash I was going to get a second number. Okay. Well, um, so, so far, so good with this theory. Now let's go to du phi dagger, d mu phi. And let's see what this is in the vacuum if we use this as R D mu. And if we say that in the vacuum, the Higgs field phi assumes a vacuum, a mean value in the vacuum like that. Do you want me to do this in detail? I'll be happy to do it in detail, or I, I'll... I mean, I don't need to see you do all the multiplications. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, then what you get is g squared v squared over 4, w plus mu, w minus mu, plus 
plus b squared over 8. And this is the cute part. GW3 mu minus G prime B mu squared. So in other words, there's a linear combination of these generators that leaves this vacuum state zero B invariant. Because This is one combination of W3 and B mu. This is an orthogonal combination. It's not appearing here. Its mass is still zero. Its mass is zero after symmetry breaking. So what I guess it's Weinberg, um, who's one of the best writers in the physics community. Um, and one of the signs of a good writer is that you um, introduce symbols that people latch on to. Um, and so he introduced tan theta as um, g prime over g. And this was forevermore called the Weinberg angle. And in fact, um, people called it theta w. And then people were saying, well, the W was the Weinberg boson and everything. The rumor among, pe among the people I talked to frequently was that, um, that this upset Glasher, I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, um, so this is the, oh my goodness. I copied this page incorrectly on the left-hand side of all the equations of this. This is going to be a tricky. Oh, I cut the book. Okay, so it's not that bad. All right. So this is the. So let, let, so we were at. You walked out before I interpreted this. Obviously, the charged Ws get a mass, and the mass is essentially g squared b squared over two. Okay. W plus and W minus charge Ws. And then there's some linear combination of W3 and B that gets a mass. But there's an orthogonal combination, which would be G prime W3 plus G B mu. It would be massless. It's not here. It's mass is zero. That's the photon. So Weinberg introduced what people call the Weinberg angle as G prime over G, calling that tan theta. And I, I bet it would be absurd trying to lecture on the of the equations in the same term. So page two. Okay, so we're going to call Z mu the thing that's here apart from the, in fact, the unimodular, so to speak, combination W3 mu minus sine theta C mu. So in other words, if we define, let's put it this way, we want to call the thing that's here that's of unit strength Z, the Z gauge boson, well then we multiply one of them by cos theta, one by sine theta, and then just identifying cosine theta with g and sine theta with g prime, we get that uh, g prime over g is tan theta. All right. And all right, so what's the relationship between these things? Well, you can see that that this mz squared, what is it going to be? mz squared is going to be v squared over 4 times effectively g squared, let's see, it's g squared plus g prime squared times v squared over 4. Um, 
Well, there's some algebra to work out here, but that's what it turns out to be. And now, if you, re if you look at that again, this is uh, v squared over 4, and this g squared is, um, we can rewrite it as a g squared here, and then it's 1 plus, no. let's see, I think I've written this backwards. Um, All right, I've rewritten it like this. So this is correct, duh. And um, now what we get is this is v squared g squared over 4 times 1 plus tan squared theta. On the other hand, that's v squared g squared over 4. Huh? Inside the parentheses should be a, a g squared. That's g squared. Inside. No, outside. I, well, it doesn't matter. No, inside, it should be a g squared, not a g. Duh. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is um, this is sine squared over cosine squared. So this is then uh, cosine squared plus sine squared over cosine squared. And so altogether, m z squared is v squared g squared over 4, 1 over cosine squared theta. On the other hand, mw, well, because these are charged, this in fact is the mw. And so this is, in other words, mw squared over cosine squared theta. So the equal sign goes like that. So that means that mw is mz cosine theta. So that's, the prediction is that the charge gauge boson is lighter, and the reduction is by whatever cosine theta is. And um, so this, this, these theories were put forward. Um, I know that one, uh, Weinberg's was in about 1967, and um, in fact, my understanding is that nobody referred to it for two years, the Weinberg's paper, and then there were one or two references, and then all, of, and then so now we're getting into the early 70s, and by about 73, there was a big confirmation of this experimentally. In fact, I was in a meeting, and Glashow was sitting behind me. And when a certain slide came up, I heard Glashow say, there are the neutral currents, which is the prediction. So let me get to the neutral currents. But let's get on with, 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 with this. All right, so finally we get the um, what happens, what's the effect of generate, as, as I said before, this effectively reproduces the, at low energies, the, uh, the Fermi theory. And the terms that do are uh, nu bar L, gamma mu, El, e bar, e bar L, gamma mu, nu L. And this is identified in, in the Fermi theory as minus 4G over root 2, which is a weird notation, nu bar L, gamma mu, EL, e bar L, gamma mu, nu L. And the funny notation may be because of the, uh, the gamma phi. Anyway, the deal is G over root 2 is G squared over 8 MW squared. So what this predicted right away, since the Fermi constant was already known by measuring beta decay, et cetera, this predicted what mw was. Well, it doesn't know. It predicts what g squared over mw is. But on the other hand, we need to look at the rest of the covariant derivative. Um, So let's 
look at GW3 mu T3 plus G prime B mu Y over 2. And now this we can say is, we can now write W3 and B in terms of Z mu and something orthogonal to Z mu, which we'll call A mu, the photon field. And if we do that, what we get is G cosine theta Z mu plus sine theta A mu times T3 plus G prime minus sine theta Z mu plus cosine theta A mu times Y over 2. Okay, so that's just re 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 expressing W and B in terms of Z and A, where A is just the unitary combination of W and W and B that's orthogonal to Z. And um, at that point, what you see is that what is A coupled to? Well, this is then dot, dot, dot plus a mu times g sine theta t3 plus g prime cosine theta y over 2. Or since g prime is g tan theta, this is a sine theta also. So this simplifies to g sine theta times plus y over 2. And aha, this is q. So this is g sine theta q. So that tells us that g sine theta has to be e. Okay, so now we have a whole puzzle of things. We've got that mw and mz are related by cosine theta, that g and theta are relate, uh, have to give us e, and that g over mw squared is the Fermi constant, which is known. So we now have what? We have one, two, three equations in but I guess of three unknowns. I can't imagine that you can actually predict anything there. Um, there must... There must... Could, the reason I say you can't, if that can't have been a prediction, is that um, I don't think... Uh, I don't think you can get the Weinberg angle until you actually observe it. Z. I mean, that's certainly true experimentally, but I don't think. So I think there's four unknowns. Where's the four? Well, do you know? Do you know the mass of the Z? No, no. So and w the mass and Z theta. That's three. Oh, and G. G. Yeah. Okay. Four unknowns. Duh. Okay. All right. But. Once you discover MW, once you discover one of them, you know all the others. And also, when you discover the two masses, they had better satisfy these equations. Let's first of all look at the coefficient of z. And that coefficient of z mu, in other words, it's it's the co it's it's the g cosine theta minus g prime sine theta. So it's g cosine theta, in fact, t3, g cosine theta t3 minus g prime sine theta y over 2. So this is what multiplies z mu. So this is the rest of the interaction, of the neutral part of the interaction. The charged part basically in other words, once we make the identification that g squared over mw squared, we're going to get the old Fermi theory of charge, the charge, the 
charged weak interactions, weak interactions where the charge changes. These are the weak interactions and the electromagnetic, these are the electromagnetic interactions. And these turn out to be a new kind of weak interaction where the charge doesn't change. And these have never been observed. The charge doesn't change because why doesn't change the charge over the T3? You need a T1 or a T2 to change charge. Okay, so what is this? Well, it turns out that this thing is equal to uh, you can rewrite it as g over cosine theta times t3 minus sine squared theta q. Okay. So that's a very odd combination. And when I say it's odd, the thing that I find really odd about it is that this meant that if, co if, if theta were anywhere near pi over 2, this could be a strong interaction as opposed to weak. Well, no, it's still short range, so it would be a strong short range interaction, which is kind of weird. What is a theta determined to be experimentally? It's, um, shit, I don't remember. I, I think it's the, doesn't somebody say here? I, I think it's, I, I would guess about 23 degrees, but I'm guessing result. Okay. Top of my head, <laughs> I haven't seen the thing in. And I haven't looked at the thing in years. All right. So what does this mean? This means that there's a coupling of the Z that looks like this. L is G over cosine theta. Z mu. And the rest of this is psi bar gamma mu. T3 minus sine squared theta Q sine. And um, let's see. What I'm a little bit puzzled about is where we dropped the left. You see, y over 2 is something that acts on both um, yeah. right handed and left handed field in. Uh, no, it doesn't interact in the same way, but it acts on both. Um, the T3 should just, so far we've had that only acting on left-handed field, and I'm a little surprised here. Well, wait, maybe he, maybe he means something by sidebar that I missed. Let's just... Maybe this nutshell got a little small. Um, the, the line below it makes a great deal more sense. The line below it is L is equal to G over cosine theta Z mu times one half nu bar L M mu nu L minus E bar L M mu EL plus sine squared theta E bar gamma nu, gamma mu E. All right, I think I know what's going on. The point is T3 has a zero eigenvalue. C3 annihilates the right-handed fields. It leaves them invariant, so it has to annihilate them. Okay. Oh, All right. If you don't believe, if you don't believe well, that, well, I mean that could just be by definition that it. Yeah. You, right. Right. But if you want to write it with the Q here, the Q has to act on both. Yeah. So this is fair. And um, and in fact, the Q. Right. The Q. The Q is Q. What are we going to say about that? Okay. So what does this mean? This means it's a new kind of weak interaction, a weak interaction where the leptons. Where neutrino goes into neutrino, electron goes into electron, and over here, electron goes into electron. And uh, so, in fact, in fact, it would have been better. Oh, yeah, this is this is the full electron. In fact, this is just the electromagnetic current here. Um, and then this is then. 
the left-handed electromagnetic current, and uh, then this is the full neutrino left-handed current in the ZU. And so what was seen in the early 70s, in 72 or 3, or maybe 4 or 5, no, 4 probably, um, was these interactions. And um, so in other words, um, I guess what we're talking about here, the thing that would not have been seen was scattering like, um, well, I was about to say that this is what was seen, okay, off some, off anything at all, but obviously this is not something that you see no matter who you are, right? I mean, God Almighty maybe, but not any experimentalist working in, I think it was Italy where it was discovered, yeah, probably CERN. Um, so it must have been this term, but um, now, how could you have seen this scattering in such a way that you, that you could distinguish it from the electromagnetic scattering? Um, oh, what you, see, what you would see then is that this is left-handed. Okay. So you'd see a breakdown of parity in electron scattering. So that's what they must have seen. They must have seen a, some sort of forward-backward asymmetry. At, and, and by the way, let me just mention something about all this. I said the weak interactions are short. Okay. So when are you going to see them? Well, you see them when you, have, when you are effectively looking at things at very short distances or very short time scales. That means you're at very high energies. And in fact, then the propagator, instead of being 1 over mw squared or m over mz squared, has a p squared in it. And, um, and the metric of this is such that when the p squared is that of a physical mw, this whole denominator is 0. So ineffectively, the range of the interaction and effectively the strength of the interaction goes up enormously when the, when the P is anywhere near the W or the Z mass. And so what, you, what, you, so what, what they were apparently doing then was they were, I guess it was the highest energy leptonic cell, I, I guess it was LEP1. They weren't able to get to, they weren't able to produce the W or the Z, but they were able to fire in electrons at high enough energy to exhibit the parity violation of this. And that's what Flash out saw sitting behind me. Um, of course, he was looking for it. Anyway, all right, so how do you put quarks in this? All right, so we've got five or six minutes to put in quarks. Well, you put in the quarks in the same way that you put in the electrons, effectively. You say there's a quark doublet, quark left, and uh, we have an alpha on that. So it's U alpha, D alpha. What is alpha? Alpha is one, two, or three for the three colors. And then you have U alpha right and U alpha D alpha. So those are the um, those are the quark fields, and we're just imitating what was done over here. We're saying, uh, but we're, we're 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 going beyond that to some extent, and the beyond that is an interesting thing that isn't yet resolved theoretically. But you see, there's this new R. Well, I can write the R in bold. But I wrote the new in a ghostly way because nobody knows if it really exists or not. Whereas here, we knew they existed. And in fact, my guess is that there's a new arch that plays very much a very similar role to the, to the quark. Okay, well, when you write down the Lagrangian for this, you get G, or at least I guess this is the neutral current part. You get G over cosine theta 
z mu a hat u bar l gamma mu u l minus d bar l gamma mu d l minus sine squared theta and then j electromagnetic mu. So that's the coupling there. It's the electromagnetic and then this parity violating term. And um, all right, you might say, well, what are the y's of this? Well, you use the y, you know what the T3's are for the quarks. So you figure out the y's just because you know what the charges are. And the charges of these are 2 thirds and minus 1 third. And so what does that tell you? That tells you that um, the up quark, well, I guess I knew that. So we have one half, we have y over 2 is equal to 1 sixth, 2 thirds, minus 1 third, respectively for q sub l, u alpha r, q alpha r, q alpha r, I should say, and d alpha r. Okay. So you see the theory um, all of a sudden has these blotches. In other words, it's not really very pretty here. So the So this is, Feynman said, this is unification, but you can still see the seams. He was another of the best writers in physics. And the third one comes to mind, also writes very well. Wilczek's not bad, but I don't think he's quite as good as he is, because he's younger. Get better at writing as you know. All right, so the neutral current. Well, the neutral current is the stuff that couples to the W and the Z. And um, let's just look at it. It looks like this. Well, the action density for this part of it is G over cosine theta. So it's whatever couples to Z mu. And that's a J mu leptons plus a J mu uh, quarks. And so that's that. Those are the, the, the uh, uh, neutral current interactions. And um, if you want to say, well, what does that look like at low energies? At low energies, it looks like this minus g squared over 2 mw squared times, I'll just write it as jl plus jq mu. So there's a new interaction that hadn't been seen before, and um, and you can see why it hadn't been seen before. Because in order to see it, you've got to see this parity violation, and you have to see this in an interaction that it has to be strong enough so that you can see it as as uh, it has to be. Uh, noticeable when compared with just ordinary electron scattering. And that's why it can be seen. Um, in any event, what, uh, so let's see what the sequence was. So what happened was people, people looked at these neutral current. That was the first sign that this thing was right. They saw the neutral currents. Once they saw the neutral currents, they could, um, determine theta. It turns out that's what they got first. And once they got theta, then of course you can predict every, I mean, once you get one of these things, you predict all of them. So all of them were predicted, and then in the late 70s, the W, the w was seen, um, and uh, the, I think it was, it was probably seen in a, big messy lump at Fermi lab and there's a nice sharp peak at lep 2 and then the, the Z was seen a little bit later at lep 2 
and I guess it's some fuzzy one that at at at, at, um, at, uh, at, at uh, formula. Now, um, what grain unification does? Uh, you want five minutes on grain unification, or you want to skip it? Want to quit? What do you? Five minutes. Sign with me. All right. Let me have a drink of water. All right, well, you, let me uh, once again say what I think is wrong with grain unification, namely that the thing to, the, the two mysteries that are just staring as if, uh, forget the Higgs, I mean, after all, the Higgs hasn't been discovered yet. And um, I wrote down a theory where the, you don't actually don't have a Higgs, you have instead a theory of um, non-compact gauge and non-compact group, and then the non-compact gauge boson. The gauge boson is a gauge in non-compact directions can become massive. Whether that has anything to do with nature, I don't know. But anyway, let's assume the standard model's right, there is a Higgs and so forth. It hasn't yet been discovered, but it might be any minute now at the LHC. Um, but what is embarrassingly missing is an explanation of why parity is violated maximally, not just slightly, in the weak interactions. And why we have three families of quarks and leptons. And one would think if these have, if the three families of quarks and leptons have anything to do with gauge theory, there are gauge bosons that take you from one family to another of quarks and leptons. And that, that would be the next thing to do before what George I. Blaschow did. What they did was they wanted to combine SU3 cross SU2 left, cross U1 of hypercharge, or actually, um, they normally combine them in, in what, what they wanted to do was to combine them inside a theory. And they decided the uh, smallest compact group that did that was SU5. And, okay, so how did they do it? Well, first of all, these are going to be 5 by 5 matrices. And what do these 5 by 5 matrices look like in this fundamental representation? Well, a natural thing to do is to put the SU3 of color up here. And then you put the SU2 down here. Okay. And then you have the U1 just sort of going along the diagonal. And so, and you know what the hypercharges are of all these particles. And so you can say what one half Y should be. Well, in this SU5 theory, one half Y should be represented as this. Minus a third, we already got these absurd numbers here. Minus a third, two thirds, one sixth. And it was like this. Minus a third, minus a third, minus a third, one half, one half. Okay, now I forgot to mention something to you that's really important. Um, these gauge transformations obviously commute Lorentz transformations. And um, so we're not going to be turning right fields into left fields and so forth. So the idea was to rewrite all of the fields of the theory in terms of left-handed fields. So in other words, over here we had psi left. OK, but now we have these right-handed fields, like these guys, or the quark right-handed fields. And effectively, in the fact I, in other words, if we say uh, Q right, let's just call that uh, U right, D right, alpha. Am I doing that right? I'm sort of mixing up. Previously, we were saying this was right and that was left. Um, all right, let me not do this. 
let's just say we're going to, instead of having you write, we're going to talk about you write complex conjugate, which is some you left, effectively. All right. So we're going to represent all the theories, we're going to write all the theories in terms, all the fields in terms of left-handed fields. And so then what we've got is 15 left-handed fields. And we put five of them into the five representation of SU5. And that, and they would have then these values of hypercharge. And that means that the five takes in 3, 1, minus 1 third plus 1, 2, 1 half. So in other words, this means how it is under SU3, SU2, U1. And so this is the doublet under SU2 with hypercharge 1 half. Well, which one had hypercharge 1 half? Well, this would be the right-handed um, leptons, I think, to have 1 half because the... Uh, uh, no, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they'd be the, the anti, uh, the, the complex conjugate of the left handed fields, and that would be the right handed fields. So these, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going too fast here. And then these guys are the quarks, and these would have to be the right handed quarks. So these are the right quarks. And then over here, um, it's only the down quarks? Really right-handed quarks. I don't understand the light one, but only the down. All right, let's good, 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 good point. Um, right, they're the down quarks. After all, we only want three particles, so these are the three different colors, and uh, absolutely down, right-handed, down quarks. So where are the other all of the other particles? Or we've only got we've got 15 fields. So we're just in the doing family. We're doing a third first time. five. Okay, I see. I see. And then there's a ten. I see. And um, all right, the other ones carry uh, hypercharge one half, and um, all right. I, really do want to make sure that these things are the... Well, let's see, if they're transforming under SU2 then, they have to be left-handed. Before embedding that SU2 left. But they're not, right? I mean, the right-hand one was the one with plus one half. Uh, no, that's not right. Everything had a minus sign. The Higgs field is a plus one half hypercharge. No, no, no. Right-handed to right-handed, we go from quark to anti-quark. 
So I'm confused because here we have d right is minus a third. D right is minus a third. And up here. But d bar right. D bar. D, oh, that's so d bar. <laughs> All right, I've gotten completely confused. I'm sorry. It's it's. Yeah. Let's call it a day. Yeah, I think we can call it a day. All right. Um, in any event, uh, it all works out. Uh, however, there's no experimental confirmation. As I said, I think it's theoretically premature. But uh, enough of it works out so that it, um, so that it'll, uh, it, it generated an enormous amount of interest. And then various people, including Ed Whitten, introduced SO10. That has 16 fields. And then a, a new R was brought back. Trouble is this unif if you then do this unif if you do grand unification, you obviously want one gauge coupling constant. So that means you have to have and, and how can you get you have a big strong interaction coupling constant and electromagnetic coupling constant. How are you gonna get the two the same? Well you evolve them forward in energy, and as you go up in energy, the uh, strong interaction coupling constant goes down. It goes down faster because it's an SU3. The uh, SU2 goes down slower, and they can eventually sort of meet. They don't really meet, but they kind of meet. And they meet at a very high energy. If you add supersymmetry, you can get them to meet better. But on the other hand, with supersymmetry, you bring in so many goddamn parameters, you can make anything happen. You can basically, <laughs> you, know, you could make an elephant look like a giraffe. So, um, so, uh, I don't know, I don't find that convincing. There is one aspect of this that's very nice. Remember that um, we had the charge operator. It turns out that the ch you, you can, you, you can, if you identify what electric charge is in this theory, then it turns out that it's one of the generators, or it's a linear combination of these generators. And moreover, it has to be traceless because it's in this SU5, where S means zero determinant, so all generators are traceless. You then get that the, 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 the charges have to be all related to each other. Does the special uh, mean determinant one? Excuse me? Does, the special, does S mean determinant one? Uh, right, right, right. But if something is determinant one yes. and it's E to the I, then it's T, then they are traceless. Yeah. Um, so let's let me let me see if I can just quickly get you the um, what the I mean the key. It's also anomaly free. So anomaly is referred to these things that it's 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 rather cute what's going on with anomalies. You see, in in classical theory, you have a symmetry if the change in the action is zero under some infinitesimal transformation. In quantum theory, you have to have a change of z. And z is an integral of s d fields, okay, whatever the fields are. Well, so in particular, this is e to the s d a, d psi, d psi bar, and so forth. So this whole measure has to remain invariant. For some theories, the measure change and that le that's, uh, that's a simple way, and a, a, I think a much more fundamental way of understanding these anomalies. And um, you want the thing to be anomaly free. Well, turn out as your five ways. And um, where the hell is Q here? Well, in any event, when you find the Q, you see that that gives you a relation. Whatever it is, it's, it's like the one over here. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's the, the trace day. of something is zero, and Q and 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 so something involving these the trace of the trace of Q has to be zero. And um, so, for example, uh, this thing has zero. Well, of course, it has, they all have zero trace, but one of them is Q, and that has zero trace. And so that means that. If you've got the first four, the last one is determined, and that gives you relation among the charges. So you, they, they are uh, arbitrary. You couldn't have square root of pi or something else as a charge. So 
So that's, that's the strongest point. But that would be true if you did grand unification in, in terms of any group that was simple, you know, and that had N and S here. So it's, as I said, I think it's probably premature. All right, so that's, that's all there is. Sorry I was in the eye doctor's uh, 